Welcome back to Beyond the Patterns. So today I have the great pleasure to announce an invited presentation by Farah Diba. She's from the University of British Columbia and at the time when she was giving the presentation she was a PhD candidate in electrical and computer engineering department at the University of British Columbia where she is advised by Dr. Robert Rowling. Farah's research interests are in the field of medical imaging with a focus on placental tissue characterization using quantitative ultrasound. Farah is a recipient of the Schlumberger Faculty for Future Fellowship and the 2020 Microsoft Research Dissertation Grant. She was also nominated as one of the Rising Stars 2020 by Berkeley EECS. And now we have her here, where she is giving a presentation entitled Understanding the Placenta Towards an Accessible and Effective Pregnancy System. Farah, it's a great pleasure to have you here, and the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Meyer. Uh, it's a pleasure for me. And good afternoon, everybody. So yeah, I work on placental tissue characterization using multimodal imaging approach. Uh, in today's talk, I will share my research and vision for a placenta evaluation-based pregnancy screening system that will be effective and accessible. Women die in childbirth in alarming rates. Uh, unfortunately, 94% of all maternal deaths occur in low and lower middle income countries, which are mostly clustered around the sub-Saharan Africa and Southern and Central Asian region. Only because a woman lives in a low income country makes her around 120 times more susceptible to death due to childbirth compared to a woman in a high income country. So these inequities in death, which is often cited as the largest discrepancy of all public health statistics, reflects the inequities in access to pregnancy health care. So this is an excellent example of what the famous uh, economist Amartya Sen calls, which is a remediable injustice, which is a condition that is fundamental unfair, but within our capacity to change. Now, most maternal deaths can be prevented by ensuring access to high quality care and regular screening during pregnancy. Obstetric ultrasound is an essential component of antenatal care that allows identification and management of complicated pregnancy. And therefore it can make the difference between the life and death for the mother and also for the baby. Therefore, in its 2016 antenatal care recommendation for pregnant women, the World Health Organization recommended one ultrasound scan before 24 weeks to improve a pregnant woman's experience. Until recently, the high cost of ultrasound machine has been among the, bar uh, among the barriers for the widespread implementation of ultrasound scan. In the recent years, a number of companies have launched uh, portable and compact ultrasound units, which are available for less than $5,000. With the availability of low-cost point-of-care ultrasound units, there are now greater opportunities for increased ultrasound access in resource-poor settings. However, traditional ultrasound is highly dependent on the user interpretation, and it also depends on the system settings. Therefore, the benefit of ultrasound in terms of screening for complication and appropriate referral would be limited by the lack of training and expertise in sonography. Additionally, the ultrasound image quality, the handheld units are not the same as the high-end alternatives that further affect the interpretation of the operator. But if we have an ultrasound, ultrasound machine that can provide quantitative measures, for example, a system equipped with quantitative ultrasound, that might present a possible solution. Unlike traditional one, 
quantitative ultrasound would provide the same measures irrespective of the system used, and it is also not dependent on the user interpretation. So far, I have discussed the challenge in ensuring access to pregnancy health care. Interestingly, this challenge is only the tip of the iceberg. Robert Romaro, who is a pioneer and visionary researcher in perinatal medicine, first coined the term the great obstacle, which encompasses a broad implications, including preeclampsia and fetal growth restriction. These complications cause most cases of perinatal mortality. Robert noted that current pregnancy screening recognizes the clinical manifestation of these obstetric syndromes rather than identifying the specific pathological processes. Now, the clinical symptoms are often precedented by long subclinical phase. For example, the preeclampsia. This is only diagnosed after 20 weeks of gestational period, which is marked by new development of uh, high blood pressure, and the presence of protein in urine. But research shows that the woman who develops preeclampsia will display unusual response to angiotensin, which is a vasoconstrictor narrowing the blood vessels at least five weeks prior to the onset of hypertension. Therefore, relying on clinical symptom-based screening while missing the window offered by the subclinical phase could lead to delayed identification. Even worse, symptom-based screening could lead to inaccurate diagnosis. Fetal growth restriction, for example, is defined as the case when the fetal weight is estimated to be below 10th percentile. This definition fails to identify the fetuses that are pathologically growth restricted from those that are healthy but constitutively small, and therefore it leads to inaccurate diagnosis for around 50% cases. Therefore, current symptom-based pregnancy screening is often inadequate due to delayed and inaccurate diagnosis. As current research is leading to a deeper understanding of the great obstetric diseases, it is now well recognized that the great obstetric uh, syndromes share a common mechanism that starts at the very beginning of the gestational period during placentation. Now, defective deep placentation leads to placental insufficiency and eventually placent uh, adverse pregnancy outcomes. Therefore, placenta plays a critical role in the development of ob obstetric diseases and placental evaluation should be an essential part of pregnancy screening. To summarize, we talked about two challenges in the current status quo of pregnancy monitoring. First, inequity in access to antenatal screening, where we focused on the dependence on system and user interpretation of traditional ultrasound that poses significant hurdles to reach the point of care. And second is inadequacy of current screening, which is based on clinical manifestation, therefore that lead to delayed or inaccurate diagnosis. So my vision for the future of pregnancy monitoring propels me to improve screening tools along two directions. The first is accessibility and the second is efficacy. In terms of accessibility, I envision an ultrasound-based screening tool that would be transformed from the centralized hospital-based unit to the point of care ultrasound at remote areas and that would provide objective and accurate measures independent of the system and user interpretation. On the other axis, which is efficacy, I envision a gradual shift from the clinical manifestation-based diagnosis to the one where we will be able to utilize the window provided by the subclinical phase using multimodal imaging techniques. Eventually, I envision of a technique that would be able to identify the earliest sign of placental insufficiency by detecting subtle changes in placenta structure and function. So in the next few slides, I will briefly describe my research for improving accessibility of pregnancy screening, where I have made fundamental contribution in developing the theoretical 
framework for reliable quantitative ultrasound measurement. I used regularization and machine learning tools to derive these algorithms. But before moving to that, I'll provide a brief background on quantitative ultrasound. So when an ultrasound pulse interrogates the tissue of interest, a fraction of the signal gets attenuated due to scattering and absorption. And after transmission, attenuation, and refraction, remaining part of the ultrasound Sun intensity will be scattered in the backward that gives rise to the back scattered to the conventional ultrasound beam image. Ultrasound radio frequency signal, specifically the hyponics, which is in the generation of beam images, contain useful information regarding the tissue microstructure. Quantitative ultrasound extracts this information and thereby it can effectively characterize the tissue. To achieve this in quantitative ultrasound, we apply windowing and compute pyridograms from these time-gated windows in the axial direction. Now these windowing and pyridogram computation steps are performed for both the tissue under study and also for a tissue mimicking phantoms with known acoustic properties. This allows for the normalization of the power spectra and getting, re getting rid of the instrumentation dependent factors and thereby measures the quantitative ultrasound, which are functions of tissue dependent properties only. Now among the tissue dependent acoustic properties, I focus on the measurement of attenuation coefficient denoted as A. Attenuation coefficient measures the signal intensity that is dissipated as a result of scattering and absorption, which is purely a tissue property. I also measure backscatter coefficient denoted as B that determines the ultrasound intensity that is scattered in the backward direction. And this parameter depends on the tissue microstructure specific provides an estimate of the average particle size. Now, the placenta being a dynamic organ that develops over the course of pregnancy, and multiple studies have shown that obstetric syndromes, specifically preeclampsia and fetal growth restriction, involve changes in placental microstructure. Now, reduced blood flow due to placental insufficiency leads to development of different type of lesions, including thrombosis, perivillous and intervillous fibrin deposition, and infarction. Now, the quantitative ultrasound provides the acoustic and mechanical properties of the tissue, leading to the hypothesis of um, leading to the hypothesis that these properties would be significantly different in tissue with different pathological condition. And thereby, quantitative ultrasound alone can be used as an effective biomarker of the placental health. Now, the notion of quantitative ultrasound is actually very powerful because first, it is quantitative. That is a great improvement over the subjective nature of conventional ultrasound. And second, which is even more important, is it provides information regarding the microstructure of the tissue. Now, this notion is out there you know, since 1970, but still it is far from being accepted in clinical application. The reason is that quantitative ultrasound measures are subject to high variability. The window-based power spectral density estimation in quantitative ultrasound would imply a fundamental trade-off between the estimation quality in terms of uh, precision and accuracy and the quality of the measurement uh, and the estimation resolution. Selecting a large window would reduce the spatial variation noise inherent in ultrasound at the expense of resolution, and smaller windows, on the other hand, result in noisy power spectral estimate due to limited spectral resolution and spatial variation noise. A rule of thumb is a window size equal to 10 lines required to achieve standard deviation less than 10% and bias less than 10%. In achievable estimation quality in terms of accuracy and precision for the available region of interest might not be sufficient to distinguish different tissue types or different pathological states. For example, in this figure, 
um, here we can see that high estimation bias and variability obscures the separation between the placentas from control and complicated pregnancy. Therefore, quantitative ultrasound using the current state of the art fails to distinguish tissues with different pathological states. And the goal of my research to address these issues presented by the strait of triangle to facilitate the widespread clinical application of quantitative ultrasound. So with this aim, I have proposed multiple approaches. In the first method, I adopted an aggressive approach to particularly address the issue of heterogeneity. The aim was to identify a region of interest that would be homogeneous and therefore reduce the effect of heterogeneity. Now the question would be how to define homogeneity. For a large number of scatterers randomly distributed and of identical size, the PDF of the phasor amplitude of the received ultrasound signal is found to be really distributed. And mathematically, we can show that for a really distribution, the envelope SNR, which is the ratio of the uh, mean to the standard deviation of the signal envelope is approximately equal to 1.9. And now for a homogeneous region, the PDF of the signal amplitude would follow really distribution and the envelope SNR would be close to nine. However, for a heterogeneous region that can be defined as a region which is at the intersection between two homogeneous regions. Now, in this case, the received ultrasound signal will not follow a uh, relay distribution anymore. And therefore the envelope SNR deviation would deviate from the optimum value of 1.9 as we can see from these examples. And thereby, high envelope SNR deviation would imply the presence of heterogeneity in the corresponding regions. So in my first proposed method, I proposed envelope SNR deviation as the homogeneity indicator. And after applying a thresholding on this parameter, we could select a region of interest that is homogeneous. And therefore it would provide quantitative ultrasound parameter with improved accuracy and precision for a given resolution. So this work was particularly important as it was the first large scale study based on 59 placentas to establish the baseline attenuation of the placenta, which is the first step to define the range of quantitative ultrasound that characterizes a normal placenta. And furthermore, this method attained an intrasubject standard deviation of 0.39 decibel per centimeter per megahertz, which is 46% reduction from the traditional method, meaning that the measures are now more precise to be able to differentiate between normal and pathologic placentas. So this approach works great when our aim is to establish a baseline and therefore we are looking for a perfectly homogeneous region of interest. However, if the objective is rather finding the abnormality, which is often associated with the presence of heterogeneity, we just cannot throw the heterogeneous regions out. So our next methods deal with this question. In such cases, the available region of interest could only be limited to a few radio frequency samples, which is not sufficient for reliable power spectral estimation. A probable solution could be to predict the next data points given that the new samples would represent regions with same acoustic properties. So in our proposed method predictors, we implement this idea and we got very promising initial results. So therefore we are basically characterizing the tissue properties of small region of interest with high resolution and high estimation quality by virtually extending the property to a larger region and therefore essentially extending the trade of triangle. So we implemented a wavenet based deep network where the input was the available radio frequency data point. And in each iteration, we predict the next data point. Now wavenet is an autoregressive model. Therefore each predicted sample is conditioned only on the previous ones. And we repeat this process in times to generate n predicted points. Therefore given a small window RF signal, now this method would result in a larger window. Now, one key element of WaveNet is the stacked layer of one-dimensional dilated convolution. The dilation rate increased if, as a factor of two, resulting in an, uh, in an exponentially growing recept uh, receptive field with depth. 
we designed our network with 14 layers with a reset to obtain a receptive field that could be large enough to capture several wavelengths of our ultrasound signal. Now here we show an example of RF line segment prediction using the proposed method where 50 samples have been predicted when 150 samples are given. We also demonstrate that for a large window of 10 lambda 10 wavelength, our bias and standard deviation remained below 5%. But when we use a small window, we including only five lambda, now the bias is almost 7% and the standard deviation is as high as 20%. But what will happen if we use a predictor's window that has five lambda from the original small window and five lambda is predicted? So we can see that now the uh, predictor's window gives similar bias and similar standard de deviation compared to the larger window. So this basically implies that we can improve the resolution from 10 lambda to five lambda while maintaining similar estimation performance. So these pioneering method models ultrasound radio frequency data prediction as a forecasting problem and presents the first deep learning application and successfully uh, deep learning application for quantitative ultrasound. And therefore it successfully extend the persisting trade-off between precision and resolution in quantitative ultrasound. So in the previous methods, we analyzed the ultrasound data windows in an isolated manner. Now I'm going to briefly explain the physics aware adaptive regularization method where we exploited the spatial consistency information by using measures from multiple windows. So here, why is the ultrasound power spectral estimates we obtained from our experiment? A are the system equations and X are the quantitative ultrasound parameters that we want to measure. Now, as we reduce the window size to improve the resolution, the noise in the equation will increase. However, now we recognize that we have multiple noisy measures from multiple windows. Theoretically, by compounding in statistically independent but equivalent real realization, we can improve the precision of the uh, measure where the standard deviation reduces with the rate of one by root over n. We can also safely assume that the quantitative ultrasound measures in neighboring windows will not vary drastically, rather would undergo gradual change. Therefore, I propose a total variation regularization on the quantitative ultrasound parameters, exploiting this sparse spatial variation assumption while compounding multiple measures. And this algorithm effectively improved the estimation accuracy and precision, uh, as we can see from this figure, for a given resolution for homogeneous regions, where the homogeneity indicator remains below a predefined threshold. But when the presence of heterogeneity is significantly over the predefined threshold, this approach again succumbs into the previous trade-off triangle as the presence of heterogeneity corresponding to a large, corresponds to a large variation in backscatter term. Therefore, it violates the relative distribution assumption, which is a key assumption for the governing equation of quantitative ultrasound. To address this issue, we apply a specially weighted matrix W, which is a function of the envelope SNR deviation that modulates the regularization of the backscatter. For a homogeneous region, this weighting has little effect on the regularization, while when there is a presence of heterogeneity, uh, this weight decreases, and therefore the regularization effect on the backscatter term is relaxed, and it allows the backscatter term to change. Incorporating this special weighting extends the uh, trade-off between the equation, uh, between the estimation quality and resolution, even in the presence of heterogeneity, therefore indicating a breakthrough in quantitative ultrasound. And we further extend the method to apply a 3D regularization using N plans from our volumetric ultrasound data, resulting even a further improvement in precision over the theoretical rate of one by square root N. Contrary to the uh, existing 1D and 2D tools, this volumetric imaging provide enhanced visualization and interpretation. 
particularly for an application of fatty liver detection, where fatty liver is defined by a fat fraction uh, that is greater than 5%, the parameter map clearly shows the spatial dis distribution of quantitative ultrasound of the acoustic properties along the liver. We also showed significant positive association of attenuation coefficient and backscatter coefficient and a negative association with effective scatterer diameter with the proton density fat fraction measured by the MRI sequence, meaning an increased amount of fat within liver would result in large attenuation and large scattering, while the underlying effective scatterer size would be reduced. So this method was very successful to identify fatty liver with a near perfect classification performance. A version of my algorithm was also adopted in Velaka TM, which is a portable handheld ultrasound by Sonic Insights. Um, with the FTA clearance in 2020, the technology offers a practical way to assess millions of people affected by the chronic fatty liver disease. So far in, the, uh, in this part of my talk, I have described several quantitative ultrasound algorithms that would lead to point of care ultrasound, um, and thereby, thereby it would be a first step to improve the accessibility of point of care too. These are all great, but what does this mean particularly for a pregnancy screening tool in terms of improving efficacy? Specifically, the quantitative ultrasound best would improve the accessibility as it provides objective measures that we showed so far. But now the question we're addressing is whether these measures would provide placental evolution and therefore lead to an effective screening tool. So in the second part of my talk, I would try to answer the so what question where my objective will be to validate the hypothesis whether quantitative ultrasound actually can provide objective measures of the pathological state of the placenta. So to reiterate, my vision to improve the efficacy of pregnancy screening involves a gradual shift from clinical manifestation-based diagnosis to the subclinical symptom identification. The first step towards this vision would be to develop the imaging system. Correlative imaging that acquires, aligns, and fuses complementary information using multiple modalities from the same placenta specimen is particularly important to study placenta structure. And therefore, with this goal of identifying effective biomarker of placental health, we propose the project SOF 2.0, which is a multimodality placental imaging study uh, that I consider to be a highlight in my PhD journey. So I was entrusted with autonomy to design the protocol and conduct the project SOF 2.0, where I led a multidisciplinary team including clinicians, radiologists, pathologists, and sonographers from BC Women's and Children's Hospital. In this comprehensive clinical study, we collected a large multimodal placental imaging data set with unprecedented breadth. It included ultrasound, MRI, and histopathology that were obtained from both normal and complicated pregnancies. Now, one central challenge in multimodality placental imaging is attaining the alignment among different modalities that would enable correlative analysis. Now, placenta, unlike the other organs such as prostate, does not contain sufficient anatomic landmarks, which are visible in multiple modalities. So my goal was to propose a protocol that would serve as a simple but powerful tool for the placental scientific community to replicate the ex vivo placental imaging. Therefore, I proposed a co-registration co process using readily available and non-invasive tools, such as India Inc., cod liver oil capsules, smartphone cameras, unlike previously used invasive tools such as needle and thread. Therefore, it ensured that this processing does not damage the tissue or disrupt imaging for any of the modalities. So to briefly explain the study, uh, to briefly explain the study protocol, in the first step, our sonographer would examine the placenta to identify two regions, one would be homogeneous and one lesion, in a way that both regions lie on the same axial lateral plane. The two regions and the plane were then marked used, used, uh, using India ink and MRI visible 
uh, capsules. The interplane would be later be included in the MRI field of view, while the ultrasound and the pathology slides would include the marked region of interest. And for the MRI, the placenta was positioned such that the laser beam localizer uh, aligns with the mark on the fetal surface, indicating the plane of interest, and multiple MRI sequences were then used to image the placenta. And the quantitative ultrasound imaging of the placenta was performed using an elastrography system where the transducer was positioned to image the placenta at the marked region of interest. And then we use this volumetric ultrasound radio frequency data to compute the quantitative ultrasound parameters, including attenuation, backscatter coefficient, scatter size, and elasticity. And after imaging, each placenta also underwent pathological examination, where the full thickness pathology slides were collected from the marked region of interest. Now, the multimodal imaging study involves four coordinate systems, including world, MRI, ultrasound, and pathology. Uh, the digital photograph of the fetal surface, along with the marking and the uh, ruler and fetus shells, provide the location of the region of interest one and region of interest two with respect to the world coordinate system. The relative position of these uh, regions with respect to ultrasound and pathology coordinates are also known. What we don't know is the relative location of these regions with respect to the MRI coordinate system. The MRI coronal slice corresponding to the fetal surface shows the fiducials as well as the placenta boundary. Therefore, the relative location of these two regions along this plane of interest can be found by co-registering the digital photograph with the MRI coronal plane. And finally, the multimodal co-registration are attained by performing ultrasound to MRI and pathology to MRI registration. So this registration method using the proposed approach was able to achieve excellent performance with mean uh, fiducial registration error less than three millimeter and target registration error less than six millimeter. And to get an idea, this amount to 4% of the placental dimension along the line connecting the fiducials. Also, quantitatively, uh, qualitatively, we demonstrated excellent co-registration performance where we found similar trends along this white line that goes through a hematoma region within the placenta. And we show similar trends in the quantitative ultrasound and MRI uh, profiles uh, along this white line. Therefore, the proposed co-registration approach provides a versatile tool for the placental scientific community to replicate and extend ex vivo placental imaging using a wide range of commercial and research imaging modalities. And this experience of uh, leading this highly collaborative and first of its kind study places the, uh, our group in a leadership position in global placental research. The dataset acquired in a SWIFT 2.0 project allows us to find non-invasive features that can be used as effective biomarkers of placental health. To navigate through this gradual shift from clinical manifestation-based identification to subclinical symptom identification, I adopt the following approach. First, I would investigate whether the non-invasive imaging features can predict pregnancy outcomes using the clinical data as the ground truth. And second, I would investigate whether these imaging features are correlated with the pathological findings. So first we investigate the correlation between imaging features and the clinical diagnosis. We apply the quantitative ultrasound algorithms on the placental data obtained from both normal and disease pregnancy. Using a support vector machine classifier, this quantitative ultrasound-based approach was able to differentiate complicated pregnancy from the normal ones with an overall accuracy of 87%. And this was the first work to show that quantitative ultrasound measures uh, of the placenta serve as biomarker of preeclampsia and fetal growth restriction. And next we focused on analyzing imaging biomarkers that are associated with pathological findings, particularly to the presence of molecular fat. So to give a little background, fatty acids are essential for fetal development. And recent research found that placentas from pregnancies complicated with um, 
preeclampsia had higher, significantly higher lipid content compared to healthy placentas. Now, visualization of fat droplets in the placenta require powerful optical modalities and exogenous absorbers to label. The, the low penetration depth that is achievable in optical imaging and the need for these exogenous labels limit the application of uh, most of the optical modalities to in vitro and ex vivo specimens. Therefore, techniques that would enable imaging of the placental fat in vivo could open up new research directions leading to new understanding of placental mm -hmm. function. So in my PhD research, I have showed that quantitative ultrasound can indirectly measure the special variation of placenta fat. Here we present a placental example with a focal lesion uh, of corangioma, and we acquire ultrasound MRI and pathology images from these corangioma regions and also from a normal region. And we show this co-registration between MRI and ultrasound, and here, this is the pathological findings of the infected corangioma, which has been shown co-registered with the MRI as well. So we measured the attenuation and MRI fat fraction in this lesion region and also from a normal region. The attenuation and fat fraction maps both showed lower values in the corangioma region compared to those in the normal region, indicating relatively increased water content in the infected corangioma. So this was the first work. It is an initial result that demonstrated the promise of quantitative ultrasound for non-invasive assessment of underlying fat deposition. And this result was particularly important as it shows that quantitative ultrasound could potentially be an effective biomarker of underlying pathological states. So to summarize, my research accomplishment involved establishing the baseline for placental uh, quantitative ultrasound, as well as advancing the state of art in quantitative ultrasound for soft tissue in general. Specifically, I have uh, proposed a prior based regularization technique where the prior has been derived from the ultrasound physics. My method predictors was the first to apply deep learning approach in quantitative ultrasound using a forecasting model. And this method that ensured that the tissue measures we are obtaining are high resolution, precise, and accurate, and therefore they can effectively characterize the tissue, eliminating the dependence on user interpretation and system setting. So this is a step forward to improve accessibility in regions with limit limited resources. While pushing the frontiers in quantitative ultrasound for the application of soft tissue in general, my proposed methods have identified novel biomarkers of placenta-mediated diseases, starting from the clinical diagnosis to the pathological findings, establishing a new results in placenta research. So given that we have a tremendous amount of placental data, we have just started to uncover new information as well as new research direction regarding image biomarkers and their implication in placenta mediated disease. Now I'm very, at a very exciting stage of my research where I'm thrilled to explore multiple new directions with research goals that I temporarily, temporarily divide into three, uh, three sections. So in the first section would be the immediate goals, which I expect to attain in one to two year time frame with the existing data, my uh, expertise and possible collaboration. And midterm goals is uh, would be acquire new data for new skills and larger collaboration. And finally, for long term goal, I dream to work uh, in even in with a stronger and diverse collaboration from a wide range of disciplines. So the goal of my immediate research would be to develop portable ultrasound based screening tool equipped with quantitative ultrasound imaging based on clinical and pathological correlation. So based on the success of the ex vivo ASWF 2.0 project and phantom study uh, on using portable ultrasound, uh, so my first work would be on quantitative ultrasound in utero or in vivo for detecting placenta mediated diseases. So the objective of this study would be multifaceted, where the first objective would be to find the imaging correlates of clinical diagnosis, for example, normal pregnancy versus pregnancies complicated with preeclampsia. And the study will also identify the imaging correlates of the uh, significant pathological findings, such as whether the placental region is healthy or correspond to a cyst or infarct. I will further investigate pathology, annotate cell phenotypes and lesion types in uh, 
um, using deep learning methods. And finally, I will focus into the optimal integration of quantitative ultrasound imaging into portable scanner. And moving forward to the midterm goals, as I previously demonstrated that quantitative ultrasound can indirectly measure the spatial variation of placental fat. As a future direction, I would focus on photoacoustic imaging, which would be important for the direct measurement of the placental fat, and therefore it would provide a validation tool for the quantitative ultrasound-based approach. Photoacoustic imaging, unlike uh, optical um, imaging modalities, uses the uh, combination of light and sound, and therefore it can provide deep penetration at high resolution and high optical contrast. It also can use the anatomical components such as water and lipid as endogenous agents, and therefore it allows label-free imaging of fat and water at substantial depths in vivo. And therefore, in my midterm research goal, I will have the following objectives, where first I will design a photoacoustic imaging system the second objective would to involve animal studies and ex vivo studies using the developed system. And uh, further, I would try to improve the existing trade-offs in photoacoustic imaging uh, to achieve the depth and resolution required for in vivo placenta imaging. And final objective would be to conduct in vivo placental imaging using the photoacoustic uh, system and analyze the correlation with underlying pathology as well as with non-invasive ultrasound biomarkers. And for, uh, for my long-term research, I will uh, I dream of I dream to adopt a holistic approach by integrating multiomics. So particularly, I will try to understand how a biological process is reflected in imaging and define non-invasive clinical biomarkers as surrogate for specific clinical outcomes. So to conclude, I envision that the future of pregnancy screening will have placenta as a key component within this. And to realize this vision, I dream to shift from a traditional radiology pathology correlation paradigm to one where I could understand the association between the imaging phenotypes and the molecular phenotypes. And the goal would be to have non-invasive, effective, and accessible biomarkers with molecular interpretation, and that would be readily available uh, at the point of care and would enable health worker to proceed with time critical and potentially life-saving diagnostic decisions. And that's all from me today. And I'd be very happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you, everyone. For, thank you very much for this presentation. It was really exciting. And I have a little bit of applause for you, which I hope you can hear. So thank you very much. our audience can't clap. They would be knocking on the tables in Germany. And um, here I have a small sound sample for you. Farid, this is very interesting work and it's very nice work. And I think you you deliver something that is really quantitative to ultrasound because the, I think the, the main reason why ultrasound is not really that quantitative is because the, the operator is, it's operator dependent where you're pointing the ultrasound probe. Like if you do geometric measurements, mm -hmm. then the problem is that you need to have the right slice image to do to, to reproducive uh, measurements, right? That's one of the key problems, and this is completely gone with your tissue characterization, right? Mm -hmm. can, can you comment on that? Do I understand that right? Okay. Yes. So uh, basically, on the terms of accessibility issue, the question is, it depends on how the user is using this. And the radiologist or the sonographer actually needs five or 10 years of experience to be really experienced to have a good picture of the placenta of the fetus. And it also depends whether there is a complication. It depends on the understanding or the interpretation of the image because it's very subjective. So quantitative ultrasound in terms of accessibility would provide the tool that will not depend on the user interpretation. And the second thing is um, in a current screening, placental evaluation is not a part yet because the role of placenta is yet less understood. Mm -hmm. So the uh, objective would be to establish the placental numbers at the quantitative measures as a measure of placental health or pregnancy health. And that would again further improve the efficacy where the current st state of the art is standing, where placenta is being neglected and only these diseases are detected when uh, this is all already in the clinical manifestation phase. Uh, therefore, incorporating the placental evaluation would further improve the time uh, that um, I mean, the time when we can diagnose it would be much earlier than the 
phase when it has already been clinically manifested. So if, when you go to quantitative, is it it's mainly the calibration phantom that you need, right? Otherwise, you're relying on off the shelf hardware. Is that what yes. I understand that yes. correctly? Yes, yes, that that is correct. So we need a phantom that would calibrate. And otherwise, we we uh, can use the um, data that is has been processed for the further processing. We do not need to change the cali or change anything within the system yes. that That's mm -hmm. super useful. Um, I also love the, the distribution based features. That's such a nice idea. So did, did, did you come up with that? Or how, how, how did you? Um, when did it occur to you that this is a good feature to characterize whether the tissue is homogeneous or heterogeneous? Oh, so uh, are you asking about the envelope SNR? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Uh -huh. uh, so yeah, it was actually, I would say, I mean, trying different things to uh, define the homogeneity. And so in ultrasound physics, there are some definitions, but it wasn't explicitly said that it would, imp I mean, uh, imply heterogeneity or homogeneity. However, we do multiple experiments and we found that it could be a good indicator of homogeneity. It's, it's, it's such a it's so convincing when you present that and you look at it and say wow oh my god that's that's something that must work and it seems to work it's really cool um, thank you so that. much <laughs> so for for the fatty liver experiments what was the number of uh, patients and test subjects that you had there Uh, so for the initial study that I showed the result where it, it was a small study, we had only 20 patients. Okay. But and uh, among these, uh, 14 were normal and six were abnormal. But on the commercial stage, it was much larger uh, study, but I didn't have, I mean, direct part. I, I just provided my algorithm. But so mm -hmm. I don't have exact idea. But in my paper, it was a small study with 20 patients. <laughs> Yeah, but it's, it's it's enough. It's enough to show a significant effect, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah. the, so the correlation was very strong with uh, around 0.95 or it's yeah, or yeah, something. Yeah. So yeah. correlation was very strong to show yeah. that it, it it could be an effective biomarker. Very very impressive. Um, also, the the multimodal study that so much work. You, you align the the ultrasound, the the MRI, and the histology. That's wow! It's very impressive. It, it, how did you register? Did you have a specific registration method that worked best? It, um, how how did you set that up? So I used a, uh, I mean, already available algorithm, coherent, uh, I mean, co coherent uh, point, al coherent cloud algorithm, and mm -hmm. it had, I mean, uh, it is a re rigid registration algorithm where we have, uh, I mean, identified the boundaries in the uh, placenta in the in the MRI and also in the digital photograph, and we uh, registered this uh, point cloud from these two modalities. Nice. And what is the number of samples that you processed for the multimodal? Did so so much work. Uh, uh, so there are 46 sample, uh, 46 placentas. 46. So wow. 46, 20 from the normal uh, placentas and 26 from the uh, diseased placentas. And um, I'm. I, s I figured this the investigations were then done after birth. Um, yes. of the placenta, I see. Yes. So these uh, are ex vivo uh, placenta specimens. Did, did you publish that data uh, to the research community? Uh, so two of the papers are still in the review process. Mm -hmm. And so two conference papers have been published, but I'm also, go I mean, the um, that would combine all the multimodality imaging result that is still under preparation so i'm still writing that that paper yeah, yeah but are you planning on doing that i mean i mean this is also health information so it could perfectly understand if you're not doing this yes is there a plan yes. To do so? yes 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 definitely yeah we are we're really excited to i mean have this paper uh, or uh, this work published and uh, oh absolutely you you have to keep me updated I, if if you have the link uh, to the data or to the paper when it's published uh, That will be very interesting. That's really cool work that you're doing there. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and the the um, the fat liver biomarkers that you showed in the end is this in vivo or is no? This is also using exactly the same data, right? Uh, liver is in vivo. So we had 
the liver study as in vivo where the patients. So yeah, we didn't. Uh, I mean, we couldn't excise these yeah. livers. It was, uh, yeah. And and the but the placenta placenta fat study was of course. Oh, yeah. On, on it, the... was it was ex vivo. It was ex vivo. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Wow. Oh. For this is impressive work, and you have a whole plan set up for for the future until the the next uh, ten years of work. Uh, it's very amazing to to see how you're all set up, having this goal uh, setting as uh, it's really cool. How how did you come up with with all of this? Um, The, that's amazing that you have this very strong um, yeah, research idea and you already know the you, you probably are now writing grants about this right and um, yes we are planning and planning to write grants and in terms of ideas I mean uh, I would say the fat fi the finding of the placental fat is kind of serendipitous we didn't expect that we'll see that but we are also already working on liver fat. And then we have this MRI sequence that can measure fat in the tissue. So we thought that why don't we use that for placenta just for a curiosity whether there is any fat or not. While our clinicians say that even if placenta has fat, it would be very small or we it, 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 it is non-existent. I mean, it is not because we cannot see it even in pathology. So it, it, this needs really strong optical modalities. So yeah, the understanding is the significance is not that much in placenta, uh, I mean the fat in placenta. However, only a few research shows that there might be a significant role. So there, these publications are not many in number and these are only recent publications. So this method was, uh, we just kind of pursued that out of curiosity and that gives us some results that were very promising. And I wouldn't say that is conclusive. We are all, all, only uh, started in relation of the placenta. Really nice work. I, I must say, wow, really cool presentation. Thank you very much for the presentation and showing all of this. Yeah. And yeah, I have another I round think I of applause for you. Or, yeah. Yeah, sure. Thank you for watching this episode all to the end. And I think we heard an interesting talk about placental imaging, the challenges and very clever solutions as proposed by Farah. So if you're interested in this topic, then please leave a comment. You can also send us an email. I will forward it to Farah and she will answer your questions. And of course, if you like the video, please leave us a short like just beneath this video. And I'm looking forward to welcoming you again in another episode of Beyond the Patterns. <laughs>